435. Spacious skies for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty, the fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood From sea to shining sea O beautiful for pilgrims' feet Whose stern impassion stress A thoroughfare for freedom beat Across the wilderness, America, America. Confirm thy soul in self control, thy liberty in all. Oh, Beautiful for heroes prove the liberty in strife. Who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy Success be nobleness and every gain divine. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream. Thine alabaster cities condemned by human. America, America. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Butch, lead us in prayer this morning, please.
All right, we have a birthday next door. Young lady's name's Michaela, right? Michaela. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Michaela. We did Kathleen in Sunday school. See, you guys miss out when you don't come to Sunday school. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Get her a gift, dear. Get her a gift. Bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more from heaven shore. Good job. All right. All of you can go. Go. Are all these guys going, Carolyn? Are all those guys going? Are they of going age? Okay, just checking. All right, grab a bulletin. Let's go through some announcements real quick. Let me make sure I get the right one. Not that one, not that one, not that one. Not that one. Okay, today is Veterans Celebration Day at our church. Veterans Day is the 11th of this month, so we have a little gift for all of our veterans. Uh, <coughs> if you served in the military, I want you to stand real quick. Bob, stand up. Butch and Johnny. And we're proud of our veterans. We always try to recognize them, give them a little something every year. Now, this little pen, don't stick it in your forehead. It goes on your lapel. <laughs> on your lapel. Okay, so. Yeah, you missed me. I'm standing. <laughs> what about me, Mommy? What about me? Thank you. Our veterans have always done right by our nation. I want you to know that. The little insert that uh, Debbie put in our bulletin this week, I want to say just a couple things about that insert. On the third third paragraph of it, it says, it is the soldier, not the campus organizer. I would include there, it's also not the community organizer. Anybody catch that drift? Not the community organizer, but the soldier that gave us our freedom. Uh, and then uh, down, where was it? I don't remember what the other smart thing I was going to say about that was, so I won't tell you the other smart thing. Probably wasn't worth saying anyway. But we're glad for our veterans that they have served, and they have many given their lives. Some of our uh, friends uh, did not make it back, and they're the heroes, but we appreciate them. All right, coming opportunities. Today we have choir practice at 5.30, uh, business vision meeting at 6.15. Now, we have made a proposal on the property. We made an offer. Have not heard back yet, but you do need to, to pray hard uh, about the property. Uh, we don't know what they're going to say. Uh, I believe if they uh, open the door, it's God's work and God's business. Who can? Is this on? Turn me up just a little bit then, Butch. We want people to be able to hear. Better have it just a smidge loud than not loud enough. Can all you old folks in the back row hear now? Eh? If you were like me, you could just turn your hearing aid up a little bit. But. <laughs> Choir practice today. Business means 615. Choir practice 530. Pray about the, about the property. We have made a, a, an offer, and we need to uh, ask God to either open the door or let us know that it's not something we should continue to seek. Uh, Saturday, which is next Saturday, November the 14th, is the Thanksgiving dinner at West Fallow Field Christian School at 5.30 in the afternoon. Carolyn, do you have a setup committee on that? Uh, no, I'd like one. We need some guys that will volunteer to go help set up that afternoon, next Saturday. Show of hands. Thank you, Jen. You're not a guy, but you're the best-looking guy I've seen this morning, so... Jen will be there. Marshall will be there. Who else had their hand up? Rich will be there. Mike may be there. Frank. Frank will be there. All right. What time do you want them there? Uh, if they're here by 1.30, we can go get set up and be done by 2.30. Okay. So be here by 1.30 or meet us there by 1.30 either way, right? 
And then coming up next Sunday, you'll see choir practice and then communion and the evening service. We have a Bible conference coming up in a couple weeks uh, with um, Brian Fox. Now, Brian Fox is a, 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 the evangelist who has been involved with the citywide crusade. And when I had him, I wanted him to come to do a choir uh, workshop for us. And so he's going to be here three days. And then on Saturday afternoon, the 21st, He's going to conduct a choir workshop here at the church. So choir members, you need to have that day set aside. I'm not sure exactly what time, but I'm guessing about 1 o'clock. Uh, if it's earlier than that, we'll, we'll let you know. But have that afternoon set aside. Block it off. Don't plan anything because we're, we're going to let him teach us how to be a good choir. And then I think you can see the rest of them there. We don't need to go over them all. So let's turn in our hymn books to number 356. First and last, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world the victory to win i must tell jesus i must tell jesus i cannot bear my burdens alone i must tell jesus i must tell jesus Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Michael, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. I should introduce our guest to you. This is Alex. Some of you remember Alex. She moved down to Virginia, but she's Rebecca's friend. And then the other side of uh, that boy is our granddaughter, and her name is uh -huh. Shelby. Shelby. And sitting behind Shelby, Shelby is her lovely mother, uh, Angie, and they've been in for the weekend, and they have run me ragged. I have been a chauffeur. Well, did they run us ragged. <laughs> Exton and back, and Exton and back, and Exton and back, Parksburg and back, and all of it. We just had a good time. All right, let's take our hymn books, turn to number 10. Number 10. First, and last Jesus keep me near the cross there a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross 
cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross i'll watch and wait hoping trusting ever till i reach the golden strand just beyond the river in the cross in the cross be my glory ever rest beyond the river and janice is going to fill in for Brittany this morning who is very sick still so you be in prayer for Brittany. This is a song my dad taught me ages and ages ago. And I really didn't think of it as a church song, but when I listen to the words, it really is. This old house once knew my children. This old house once knew my wife. This old house was home and comfort as we fought the storm of life. This old house once rang with laughter. This old house heard many shouts. Now she trembles in the darkness when the night wind walks about. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles. Ain't got time to fix the floor. Ain't got time to oil the hinges, nor to mend the window panes. Ain't gonna need this house no longer, no longer. I'm gonna be getting ready to meet the saints. This old house is a getting shaky. This old house is a getting old. This old house lets in the rain. This old house lets in the cold. On my knees, I'm a getting chilly, but I feel no fear or pain. Cause I see an angel peeking through a broken window pane. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles. Ain't got time to fix the floor. Ain't got time to oil the hinges, nor to mend no broken pane. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Hank, I'm getting ready to meet the saints. My old hound dog lies asleep and he don't know I'm gonna leave. Else he'd wake up by the fireplace and he'd sit there and howl and grieve. But my hunting days are over. Ain't I gonna hunt the coon no more. Gabriel Dunn brought in the chariot chariot when the wind blew down the door ain't gonna need this house no longer ain't gonna need this house no more ain't got time to fix the shingles ain't got time to fix the floor ain't got time to oil the hinges nor to mend no window pane ain't gonna need this house no longer i'm getting ready to meet the same well, some of us understand about this old house is getting shaky. <laughs> this old house needs a little oil in the joints now and then. Got a little bit of a ring up here, Rich. Don't turn it down too low because we got some folks can't hear though, so. <laughs> we could get your seat right up here. You want to come up here? It'll be fine. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 20. In honor of our veterans, I want to remind us this morning about the battlefield that we serve on as Christians and the soldiers that we should be as Christians. 
Clear back in the book of Deuteronomy, God gave some instructions about the ones who would fight the battle, fight the wars that the children of Israel were going to be fighting as they entered into the promised land. And I think it's interesting here that we understand that there are some people that have never taken an oath of allegiance or loyalty to Christ as far as being a soldier. They want to go to heaven and so they, know that they know they're saved, but uh, this concept of fighting and being a good soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ has not entered into them, uh, their thinking at all. So let's begin reading in verse 20, the first 10 verses of the chapter. It says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. Still got a bunch going on here, folks. Deuteronomy chapter 20, Ruth. I'm going to wait till they get this calmed down just a little bit. I can't take out that. Are you ready yet? All right, we're in verse 2. Now let's start again. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye shall come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth before you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath broke betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, let he die in battle, and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brother's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of the speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. So God here is telling us some very important things about fighting battles. I want to share with you just a few things, and then we're going to pray, and we'll get into the message. But our Christian life is a warfare. If you, if you go through a week in your Christian life and you're not battling the world, the flesh, or the devil, there's something wrong. You may be on the wrong side. You may never have made a, a, an honest commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ or the devil and the flesh and the world would become your enemy. And I'll say this boldly and plainly, woe to the Christian who does not recognize the enemy. The enemy is not us. We want to fight each other. We are not the enemy. We have an enemy, Satan, and we have another enemy, the world, and we have another enemy, our own flesh, and we need to be concentrated battling against those. The Bible speaks of the warfare. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's spoken of as a walk. In Hebrews chapter 12, it's spoken of as a race. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, our life is spoken of as being pilgrims. But the good fight of faith is found in 1 Timothy 6, 2 and also in Jude. We're commanded to be a part of that warfare. And it's a warfare against enemies that are very strong. When we look at our young people and we see them led astray and we talk about peer pressure, do we realize how much strength peer pressure has on a person? Well, you should because we as adults face the same thing. And that pressure comes from the three enemies I've already mentioned to you, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But we have a great captain, and that captain is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to follow him, we need to trust him, and we need to commit ourselves to the battle that he has placed us in. The, another thing I would mention to you is the success of the war does not just depend on the captain, 
but it also depends on the soldiers. If you were in uh, the army and you did any combat at all, you will realize that not just the leader or the officer had to be marching toward the enemy and firing at the enemy, all of the people in the army under him and his platoon also had to be fighting and firing toward the same enemy. We have success when we fight together. Many soldiers in the army have been found to be unfit. Uh, we just witnessed one of the great tragedies, I believe, that we've ever seen in, our, in the, the history of our nation when we traded um, five enemy combatants for Bergdahl. He was a traitor. Uh, in World War I, World War II, the Revolutionary War, if they had found him on the battlefield, they would have given him a court-martial on the battlefield and probably set him in front of a firing squad and shot him for desertion. And we gave up high-quality enemy combatants for him. So there's some soldiers <clears throat> that are unfit for battle, and we want to look today and see that we become a fit soldier in the Lord's Army. So let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll begin. Our Father, this morning, how we appreciate the men and women who have fought on the battlefields and served in the military and given their lives for whatever amount of time it was that we might enjoy freedom in America. May we never cheapen it. May we never forget the price that it cost. And may we always honor those who have served and are serving because they are extending to us those liberties. You gave them to us. We, we believe that our freedom and our liberty comes from you, God, but you've also given us a military that defends that and keeps it so that we are free and we have liberty. So as we mention these truths this morning, may we be reminded that we are supposed to be in a warfare for you also, fighting for your kingdom here on earth, fighting that others may come to know Jesus here on earth, fighting against the evil, oppressive sin, the wickedness of Satan, the wickedness of society, here on this earth. Help us to see that we can become soldiers worthy of the name, worthy of being serve, of serving in the army of the Lord if we will be fit soldiers. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You'll notice some things here as I read these verses uh, from verse 5 on. Uh, you probably noticed that it, the officers began to speak to the people and he said, if you're not totally dedicated, you need to go on home. That, that's an interesting thought, and that's a, an important thought for the Christian. W what happened to this idea of being dedicated to the Lord? In verse 5, it says, The officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Then he talks about planting a vineyard in ver verse 6 and in and, uh, and verse 7, having a wife and not dedicated her. What is it that attracts our attention away from being totally, wholly dedicated to the Lord? We've lost that concept. In, in Christian circles and churches today, we don't have people that are selling themselves completely out for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have enough preachers being trained in the ministry. We don't have enough missionaries that are being trained to go take uh, the places of those coming back off the foreign field. We have churches closing in this northeast quarter, 1,200 to 1,400 a year, with nobody to step in and keep them open because people, Christians in the pew, are not asking themselves, what does God want from me? I have taken the blood of Christ as my salvation. God has purchased me with a price. The Bible says we are not our own, and yet we fail to realize that, and we don't dedicate ourselves holy to the Lord. What is it that takes your dedication away from the Lord? What is it? Is it some business venture, as he speaks about here? Are you so busy earning money to make a living, to live a life here on earth, to put down roots so deep that you don't have time to serve the Lord? Is it maybe that you're building a house or your household? Maybe that's what's distracting you from completely serving the Lord? Maybe is it a family member, like he mentions here in these verses, that have kept you from dedicating yourselves to the Lord? Listen, there's a problem. When churches have more ministries available than we have people to serve in those ministries, there's a problem. 
And it's not that we should cut back on the ministries. Listen, we have had in our van routes just recently about 20 kids saved, just under 20 kids in the last couple of months. Now we need to expand that van route. We need to have more van workers, bus drivers, van drivers, and, and uh, van captains. Where are we going to get those? Do we tell the kids, no, we can't get more kids in, we can't have more vans running because nobody will dedicate themselves to be a part of that so that the kids can come and hear the gospel and get saved? Do you realize some of these kids that come in here, the first person that's told them that they were loved this week may have been Pete on the bus route or the Sunday school teacher or Carolyn in the Sunday school class or somebody else that, that looked at them and told them that they love them this morning. We've got kids all around this area that need to be reached with the gospel. And we have an opening now, an open door to do it. What are we lacking? We're lacking soldiers in the trench. We're lacking soldiers in the foxhole. We're lacking soldiers that will put a rifle spiritually to their, to their shoulder and get into battle. We're lacking the people that have the desire to dedicate themselves to do whatever God wants you to do. Now, you've heard me say this, and every man or woman that stood and served in the military will tell you this. My first day of basic training, I realized I didn't have many choices to make. Right, Bob? You get off that bus, that TI, drill instructor, a training instructor, whichever you had, cusses you up one side and down the other. He tells you he, he's your girlfriend, he's your mama, he's your daddy. You will do what he says and you will do it immediately and you will not ask questions and you will not think twice about it. You will do it. And from that point on in your military experience, you realize you have to do what you're told to do because you don't belong to yourself anymore. Johnny's sitting here going, that's right, Brother Gary, that's right. <laughs> Mike, that's right, is it not? I'm not telling you any lies. If you've never been to the military, you don't know what I'm talking about. But that one-tenth or ten percent of us who have been in the military, we will tell you that you dedicated yourself to that amount of time in the service and you lost all your rights. They told me where to live. They told me what to eat. They told me what to wear. They told me what to, how to cut my hair. Uh, Tim Lee, young man that went to Vietnam, lost both legs there in the Marine Corps, he used to give this testimony. He said, I got tired of my mom and dad telling me what to do, what time to get up, how to cut my hair, what I was going to eat, how, what time I had to be back. I was so tired of them telling me what to do, I ran away from home and joined the Marine Corps. Well, he made a big mistake. You know, we miss somebody. You need to give Shirley one of those pens. Her husband retired from the Army, right? Army wives are just as important as a, as a veteran because they spent time in service too. They didn't, they didn't go in and salute the, the commanding officer. You did too? You got any extra? How many extras you got? Save uh, Pat and Isabel one. If you were, if you were a wife and you, you, your husband served time in the military while you were married, not before, but while you were married, just hold your hand up. We your not your brother. Let's make this a little more personal. Betty had a husband, right? Oh, well, you weren't an army wife then. Shirley, you know about army wives, don't you? You didn't have a choice about where you were going to live, did you? Nah. So when you're dedicated to the service, that's what happens. Listen, should we as, as Christians be less dedicated to our heavenly father and the captain of the Lord's host? Should we not find that dedication within ourselves? Should we not learn that lesson where Paul says, Know ye not that you're not your own, you're bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and your mind, which are the Lord's. We, are belong, we, have, we belong to God. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be fighting in this battle. If we don't fight the battle, who's going to fight it? If we don't reach boys and girls and moms and dads with the gospel, who's going to do it? We have some parents now that we need to get on the ball with follow-up with some of these bus kids, and we need to get into their homes and talk to them. How are we going to do that? We say, Brother Gary, that's your job. No, that's your job too. The Great Commission's not given just to the preachers. The Great Commission's given to every believer, every Christian. We're a part of that. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. We're a part of that, all of us. And so we need to find this commitment somehow, that dedication that we need to serve the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2 still in the Bible. At least it is mine. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's for all of us. That's for every believer. We have a debt to pay that we can never pay, but we should try. We should be dedicated to the Lord to the point that whatever he wants for us is absolutely okay. We will do it. Are we not bought with a price? Did Jesus not shed his blood for you? Do you not understand that once we're bought with a price, we belong to God? then why do we spend the rest of our lives here on earth after we, get, after we get saved living for self instead of living for the Lord? We need to be dedicated. God didn't mince any words with these people. He said, hey, if you're building a house, go on home. If you're going to be more dedicated to that house, you stay home. If you're more dedicated to that woman at home or that family at home, you just stay home. If you're more dedicated to that business venture, that, ve that vineyard at home, you just stay home because you're going to influence the rest of the people that are trying to fight. Look in verse 6 with me. And what man is he that planteth a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle. If we have not been tasting of the fruit of the Spirit, if you don't have that love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. If you don't see God planting that fruit and you don't see that fruit coming in your life, how can you fight the battle properly? How can we fight if we don't have what God has given us to fight with? Some people get saved, and I've heard people say years after they've been saved, well, that's just the way I am. Well, that's maybe just the way you used to be, but that's not just the way God wants you to be. He wants to make us more like Christ. Uh, can you see it? Jesus walking along the road, and a child runs up to Jesus. The absolute opposite of what the disciples did did Jesus do. The children start coming to Jesus, and the disciples, what did the disciples say? Get those kids out of here. Jesus doesn't have time for them kids. And what did Jesus say? Suffer the little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. You know, all these kids we had here this morning, we didn't let them sing this morning. Matter of fact, Frank, somebody left you a baby dial on the front, front row there. <laughs> but the truth is, we didn't have them sing, but you know what? I love to hear them sing. I love to watch them try to sing the hymns. I looked down at one Sunday morning, a little girl had her hymn book boy, and she was just singing right along with us. Did you catch it? This is how she held her hymn book. But she was trying her best to sing all the words. Probably couldn't even read, but she was trying. I like to see kids in church. I like it when they bump into my knees. I don't like it when they step on my ingrown toenails, but I like it when they bump into my knee. I like for our church to have the sound of pitter-patter around. You know, we visited a home one time that the, the grandmother was dying. And the uh, kids were all playing all around. And one of the daughters kept saying, get those kids, help them be quiet. And the other daughter says, don't you remember what the, what the phrase was that, that my mom used to call kids noise? Angel music. Isn't that neat? angel music. We want kids around. Jesus said, suffer them to come unto me. How, how are they going to get there? How are they going to get here if we don't have that love and compassion, long-suffering to reach out and get them? We've got two vans now. Got one sitting out there. We need to do a little body work on and get some uh, holes plugged up. But it's about ready to go on a, on a van route. Who's going to drive it? I don't mean who's going to drive it one time. I mean, who's going to be dedicated enough to be driver every time that the van needs to run? I don't mean be a van captain one time, but I mean, who's going to be a van captain every time? We've got out the gills. We've got up to our ears in Christian circles, convenience Christians. that I'll do it if it's convenient and fits into my time schedule. I'll do it then. Well... What makes us think our time schedule is better than God's? 
and what plans we've made are better than the plans God has? What makes us think that we as soldiers of Christ are not on duty 24 hours a day. When you get the fruit of the Spirit, when you start to love children and love people like Jesus does, and you get the joy of the Lord, and you get the peace of God, and the long-suffering that He wants to give you, and the gentleness, and the goodness, and the faith, and the meekness, and the self-control, the temperance, you're going to have a different outlook on people. Frank, how many did you have in your Sunday school class this morning? 10 or 11, and they run from 3rd grade to 7th grade. Now, I mentioned this the other night, but I think it was a Sunday night. 3rd grade to 7th grade. You got some 3rd graders that can barely read. You got some 3rd graders that can barely sit still. Now, that's not their fault. I, I, when I teach teacher training, I tell them, you tell a 2nd or 3rd grader to sit still, and God says, wiggle, who you think they're going to obey? Uh, that little third grader doesn't say, I think I'm going to be mean this morning and wiggle. I think I'm just not going to be able to sit still this morning. I'm planning that. No. That's just the way they are. God made them that way. I'm saying when we get the fruit of the Spirit, we will care about people enough to put ourselves out and to do what God wants us to do all the time. We have a choir up here when we sing. We, we should not just come to practice when it's convenient. Practice needs to be a part of our service to the Lord. Now, we don't have a strict rule about if you don't come to practice, you don't sing. If you know the song, I'm glad you sang. But I'm saying everything we do for God needs to be dedicated. It needs to be a dedication of time and person so that we can do it properly. Can you imagine, let's say back in Patton's time, in Europe. They're getting ready to go out into a huge push. Was he at the Battle of the Bulge? Somebody remind me, history buff. Was he at the Battle of the Bulge? Let's say Patton's getting ready to give a big push at the Battle of the Bulge. And so he goes out in the early morning and he says, fall in! And one of his commanders show up and the rest of them been out drinking all night. And one platoon falls, up, or falls out, one battalion starts to fall out, but 30 platoons are missing because they don't know where they're supposed to be. How could he ever win a battle? He couldn't. When you have a war going on and you're putting people on the front lines, they have to be where they're supposed to be or there's no success in the battle. You may, how many of you remember the old story F Troop on television? You remember it? You remember the guy, what he got his award for? He was riding, his horse ran away with him. He was trying to run away from the battle, and they saw his horse running toward the battle, and everybody started following him toward the battle. That's the way we ought to be. There ought to be so many dedicated Christians that other people get the idea, not because the preacher's harping at you, but because they see so many soldiers running toward the battle. That's the dedication we need. I would mention to you thirdly, that if you have failed to fulfill obligations in the past, you need to get a rededication of your life and get back on the front lines of the battle. Now, I know what some folks say. Brother Gilbert, we're all a bunch of gray-haired senior citizens in our church. Well, can I ask you a question? Do you think that took God by surprise? My beautiful granddaughter yesterday told me I had gray hair. I told her I did not have gray hair. I had wisdom highlights. Men's hair is parted in three ways. Parted on the right, parted on the left, or departed. But when it turns gray, that's a mark of wisdom. You've lived a few years. Can you show me one verse in Scripture that says when you get to be 50 years old, you're beyond the years of service? <clears throat> Can I tell you about a guy that fought in this army that we just read about? He was 40 years old at one point, wandered in the wilderness for 40 more years, 
And when they went into battle, he was over 100 years old when he told Joshua, God promised me a mountain. And the same God that promised me the mountain back when I was 40 years old is the same God that can give me that mountain today. And you know what he said? He said, Joshua, just tell me sick him and I'm on my way. The, the choir's practicing the song. says, I want that mountain. We have not been given a time to retire in the work of God. You say, but I'm too old to work with kids. No, you're not. What you're saying is I don't want to work with those rug rats. Those curtain climbers drive me crazy. You want to be crazy, man, you go to a baby shower. I was forced to go to a baby shower yesterday. I have never been to a baby shower. No, but no men ever are invited to go to baby showers as far as I knew. Angie gets here. She says, well, you're not invited. Becca got with Angie. Angie says, you're going. No back up there. My point is, when we get older, we may have to change what we're doing to serve the Lord to some extent, but let's let him make the changes. Well, Brother Gary, I'm tired all the time. Well, welcome to the club. I don't have enough time to get everything done now that I want to. Well, welcome to the club. You got the same hours in your week as I have in mine, that Butch has in his, that Louise has in hers. Phyllis has a few more because she rides a broom. But most people have the same amount of time in their week. You better pay her double for that one. <laughs> the point I'm making is we don't have any retirement age for the Lord's work. I, I, I've shared with you before, I get a little worried about preachers that retire and do nothing. Now there may come a time that Pete or somebody else will have to preach more in this pulpit because I won't be able to stay on task and I'll run too many rabbits, and I can't get my points across, or get me, can't get my ideas in my head. But till that time comes and God makes that change, I'm going to preach. We don't have a retirement age, folks, and I believe with all of my heart, if we have failed in the obligations in the past, you may have told the Lord, you'll teach Sunday school, you may have told the Lord, you'll sing in a choir, you may have told the Lord, I'll do this or I'll do that in the past and haven't followed through on it. Hey, we need to get back to the place where we're going to do exactly what God wants us to do all the time that God wants us to do it. That may take a rededication. We, we really, I, I, I wish I could get my heart across to you. This idea of dedication, we're, we're more dedicated to sporting events. There, there's guys in this room that if the Eagles are playing and they can get to a television or a radio, they're going to listen to it or watch it. We have one or two guys in this room that if they can watch any type of football, they're going to be in front of the television watching football. And all God's women said... Yeah, you know a few of them. We have a few ladies and any time there's a shower or any time there's a party or any time there's an Avon party or a party lights party or a Tupperware party or a... How many other kind of parties are running around now? They're there. They're there. There are times that we are more dedicated to the things on this earth than we are dedicated to God. We need to get back to the place where we're dedicated to God. Let me share one more with you here in verse 8. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Well, Brother Gary, I can't tell somebody about Jesus. I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I've been in the ministry for 43, going on 44 years. be 44 years in December. Can I tell you a secret? I've never heard of, seen of, read about any place where somebody knocked on the door and told somebody else about Jesus and they shot him on the front porch. I've never once in my life knocked on a door to tell somebody about Jesus and had them sick a dog on me. 
I've never once had anybody spit in my face. I've never once had anybody holler and scream at me, not in all the years that I've been in the ministry, never one time. You say, well, what do they do? Well, if they're not interested, they'll just tell you to do it. No, I'm not interested in that right now. Thank you. And close the door. They don't scream and holler at you? No. They don't throw boiling water through the screen at you? No. They don't sick their dog on you? No. Now, I did go through a fence one time, closed the gate behind me, went to knock on the door, and a big dog came from around the back side of the house, and I jumped the fence getting away. But the, the, the owner didn't sick him on me. I'm saying our fears are things that normally do not happen. What we are afraid of, what did Franklin Delano Roosevelt say at the Second World War? We have nothing to fear but fear itself. And fear is contagious. We get this idea that it happens all the time that somebody's going to run you off. No, it doesn't. Now, you may find one person in 100 years that has a, a, a real agnostic, mean-spirited, uh, agitated type of personality, and they may run you off. But so what? Jesus sent out his disciples, and he said, you go preach. And he told them where to go preach, to the household of, of Israel. And he says, and if they won't receive you, you shake the dust off your feet, and you go to the next place, because sooner or later somebody wants to hear it. Everybody needs to hear it, and somebody wants to hear it. So we should not get in the battle because we're fearful and faint-hearted. No, we should get our strength up. We should get our courage up. How did he answer this? What did the priest say? In verse 3, And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day in the battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. And here's the reason. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemy to save you. What, what's the song say? Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do. You believe that? Oh, yeah, I believe that. If it's you going, preacher, if it's Pastor Pete going, I believe that. But don't ask me to hand out a track. No, 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 no. Then he's not there. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's fought your battles before. He'll fight your battles again. He brought you out of the land of death and gave you life. He'll continue to fight your battles no matter where you go. Sometimes, you know, we get this idea that if we just don't want to, God's going to understand. We had a guy in our barracks. I was a squad leader, which meant I was the only one in, or one of four that they found in the, um, in the platoon that had had any marching experience, and I knew my right from my left, and so they put you to the front of the line. Johnny's shaking his head. He knows what I'm talking about. Well, we had a guy in our platoon. We had one weekend liberty. In the six weeks, our long, hard six weeks of basic training, in the Air Force. We had one weekend pass. We were told, do not go out and drink. Well, you know what? There was one guy in my squad that when he got back to the barracks that night, he was falling down, skunk, stinking, drunk. We tried to get him sober up before the TI got there. We put him in the shower. As a matter of fact, he kicked me and gave me a bloody nose while we were throwing him in the shower and turning the cold water on. The T.I. showed up. You know what the T.I. said? Oh, it, we understand. I don't remember his name. We'll call him Jimmy. We understand, Jimmy. You're, you had a lot on you, a lot of stress. We, we understand. No. He pulled guard duty every night for the next week. What makes us think our Heavenly Father understands our excuses? What makes us think that our Heavenly Father doesn't have us in His battle plan already for what needs to be done? What makes us think that if the war is breaking out all around us, we can just sit there and kind of ignore it and everything's going to be all right? Can I tell you that's why our nation's in the mess it's in right now? Because Christians for, for decades have sat there and smiled and just gone along and thought, well, it's all going to turn out all right instead of being in the battle and fighting. I got so mad the other day at television, I shouted at it. 
Hillary Clinton had the nerve to say, don't we know that 30 people a day die of violent guns? And I screamed it at her, don't you know 3,000 babies die a day murdered by abortion? And we're worried about gun control. We need doctor control. We need abortion control. Why did we get to that point? Because Christians are not shouting at their television screens and going to the polls and voting and making the noise that they should be making, fighting the battle. The men who signed the Constitution, or the Declaration of Independence for our country, rather, they pledged their life, liberty, and property for the success of gaining liberty. And most of them gave it all. We have men that went through World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, and the Gulf Wars now that have given their all. Some have given body parts. Some have given all of they, that they can give physically and gave a whole lot of a chunk of mental in those wars. And we think it's all right for us as Christians in the most important battles of the world to just sit back and remain silent and not get involved. I, I dare say God's not going to understand. I dare say when we get to heaven, God's not going to understand. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about uh, in, being in the house of the Lord, dwelling in the house of the Lord forever out of Psalm 23. And one of the verses said there'll be no more tears. Some of those tears are going to come because we're going to see, God's going to let us know maybe how many people could have been saved through our lives if we had just opened our mouth and ask them if they knew Jesus. But no, we're not dedicated. Soldiers are dedicated. Soldiers are gung-ho. Now, they may not always be gung-ho, but I guarantee you if they're in a trench and somebody's lobbing grenades and fighting and, and throwing uh, bullets their way, they're going to get gung-ho about fighting back. What I'm saying to you is we need to get back to the place as Christians where we're dedicated to serve the Lord. How many people have to die spiritually before we will do our part? But I'm old. I'm ancient. I'm ancient of days. I can't. Yes, you can. You can give. You can pray. You can be a helper. You can be a teacher. You can have a part if you just would. But I'm old enough, let somebody else do it. Well, just show me, somebody show me that in the Bible. You know, I, I hear those things, and I don't see, I can't find it where it says let somebody else do it. How long did Moses serve? Shirley? Yeah, till he died, right? How long did Paul serve? Till he died. How long did Matthew serve? Till he died. We need to get to the point where we realize God's got a job for us. We may, th may not think it's very important, but in God's economy and his battle plan, it's very important. And if you don't do it, who's going to? Who's going to reach the kids that live within a house or two of you if you don't? Who's going to give and work and pray and make the church what it should be if you don't have a part in that? We're, we're talking about buying this property. And I told you last Sunday, if everybody that was here last Sunday would just give $5 more a week, it would probably make the mortgage payment that we need to make for the month. But the truth is, God's able, but he uses his soldiers. He uses his soldiers. Are you going to dedicate yourself to be a soldier in the army of God? Father, I pray this morning as we've talked about this and remembered the dedication and the sacrifice of our warriors here on earth, that, Father, we would become warriors for you, soldiers in your army, willing to lay aside some personal comfort, willing to put our schedule and our likes and dislikes aside to do whatever you ask us to do. And I pray that you would speak to hearts this morning and we would become concerned about our level of dedication. May this morning, Lord, we decide and pray to you and to dedicate it to you that we're going to move beyond our comfort zone to serve you as one of your soldiers. 
Let's stand together with our heads bowed.